Are you a business owner looking for real advice and input? You're in the right place. From concept to launch to growth, funding and beyond. Welcome to Startup Hustle with your hosts. One once sold a business for $150 million. The other, the author of Million Dollar Bedroom. Here are your hosts of Startup Hustle, Matt DeCourcy and Matt Watson. And we're back. Another episode of Startup Hustle. Matt DeCourcy here with Matt Watson. Hi, Matt. Hey, what's going on, man? Oh, I don't know, man. I was thinking about raising a little capital, maybe doing a few things here and there, rounding up a few bucks. So You got an idea on, for me? I've been well, no, no. I'm just working on my pitch, bro. But you don't have an idea. <clears throat> I got a whole lot of them. <laughs> a whole lot of them. All right, let's hear it. Well, I think we need to talk about it first because, you know, I come here to start a puzzle to learn about what to do and what not to do because I heard this is a podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. So yeah, let's talk it out. Let's let's talk it out. Did you know that this podcast is brought to you by FullScale.io? I did. And thank you for doing the work. That's a pitch, Matt. There is still hope for you. I do appreciate you doing the heavy lifting there. You know, we, we've talked so many times about raising capital and we've had venture capitalists and we've had angel investors and we've had groups and funds and stuff like that. But I want to talk about actually giving a pitch today because let's be realistic, man. I don't think a lot of people are good at it. No. Are you or not? Um, I don't know. I, you know, like a lot of things in life, it is so hard to do something when you're too close to it. Like when it's your baby, it's like sure. when it's my business, it's hard to tell somebody else about it or explain it to them or whatever. Right. But it's a lot easier when you're looking at somebody else's thing that you don't understand as much about and clearly see the holes, clearly see the problems, clearly see the value. But when you're so close to your own thing, it's so much harder. Well, yeah, I I agree. Well, I, I completely agree with you. Now, with that, you know, it was before we start. Well, before we started full scale, I was getting ready. I wanted to raise some money for Gigabook, and I kind of realized that I might need a little help. And you know, I uh, I hired a consultant, a guy out of Manhattan, to work with me to not only create an amazing pitch deck, but also a business plan that would make sense for investors. So I hired this guy and we worked hard for a couple months and I learned a lot. I mean, I really did. I learned a lot and I've learned a lot since then. And honestly, I think that I can, I can give a good pitch now. Now, the fact that I have a background in sales and speaking and writing didn't, didn't hurt that, but it also didn't help it. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And, it, you know, so I, I think that, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to raise money, well, for really for anything, whether it's for a startup or whatever you're doing, I mean that, well, first off you mentioned, do you have an idea? Yeah. Let's assume we have an idea. All right. So yeah. But with that, the, the usual approach pattern is to document your plan, you know, meaning like a business plan. We're not going to get into that part of it, but one of the things that that is is birthed out of that is usually a pitch deck. So, and that's I think where it gets a little crazy for some people. So, first off, let's let's talk about that. So, more people are afraid of public speaking than death. So there's that. Um, now, for a lot of people, that's going to be a problem for them to overcome. Now, when I say public speaking, I think the first thing that comes to mind for most is, you know, speaking in front of a large group of people. But the same skills, the same attributes, the same fears will manifest themselves when you're talking to a small group of people as well. I mean, meaning like if you're afraid of public speaking, it, it usually doesn't matter if it's five people or 50, although the number will amplify it. So are you one of those people? Like, I, I think you're kind of like, you're, you do well in front of groups, but at the same time, I don't think it's your favorite thing to do. It, 
When I was younger, it definitely wasn't my favorite thing to do. It doesn't bother me at all anymore. I could get up in front of a thousand people and it wouldn't fade sure. me. I don't really care anymore. Yeah. And like I said, you, you do well. And, and the, there's a difference though, between being able to do well and feeling a passion for it though. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's one thing to be able to get up in front of speak speak in front of other people. It's another thing to like be able to carry the crowd. Right. And like be interesting and be funny and like be, you know, like really, really well rehearsed and be a very good presenter. Those are, I mean, it's, it's no different than be like, trying to talk to girls. I, I could talk to girls. doesn't mean I can get one, <laughs> right? Like there's a different level of like accomplishing the goal here. <laughs> part of, part of that whole thing is knowing when to get the pitch back on track or the presentation. And you did an effective job of that just now, Matt. So, yeah. um, you know, th- there's, when it comes to a presentation and a pitch, there can be a lot, there can be more pressure involved with that for someone than giving a, just a general speech. Cause oftentimes a general speech doesn't have the ramifications that talking to yeah. people that can write a check. So it's a pressure cooker for a lot of people. It is. You know, and, if you really, if you talk about a pitch, I mean the, the popular show shark tank is nothing but investor pitches. Well, and, that is like perfectly well rehearsed. I guarantee they got producers that are grooming every minute of that conversation, how they come out and dance and do the little thing and all of it. Well, we've talked to Roy Scott about that. I mean, it's literally like a several month process. Yeah. Now that said, people still get there. They turn on those lights and they freeze. It's go so, time. Yep. So, you know, most people have heard of, of the pitch deck in general. So let's talk about that. Cause I think that, you know, there's a pitch deck is intended to be a simple outline for your presentation. And where a lot of people get off track with the pitch deck is they make it overly verbose. They put too much information in there. Um, they complicate things. They focus on things that aren't necessarily important to investors. And like you said, sometimes you're too close to the, to the product and you get enamored with all the features of it, yeah. but you're maybe not focused on what those benefits are. Um, or in some cases, and you know, is it like, I re- well, we went over st- a Stackify pitch deck once. And I, I remember that we were at your house and uh, I think I may have stolen wine from your cellar that night. But <clears throat> some of the things that we went through were just like shortening statements or just rearranging simple things. And it wasn't that it was, it, the pitch deck was fine, but simple, simple, simple is good in this. Well, situation. and I, I think the biggest problem we have, and I can be guilty of this is I'm a product guy, right? I love to build products and people get enamored with their product and what it does, but they completely forget about like why people use it. You know, it, it's, uh, we were talking about this in a meeting the other day and people talk about like, Super Mario brother, the Super Mario, right? He wants to be the guy who shoots the balls. He needs the flower, right? And and like we're selling the flower and we're so enamored with the fact that we sell flowers, but he wants to be the guy who shoots the balls. He doesn't give a shit about the flower, right? Right. Is my point. And, but we get so enamored with the flower, um, the visual of this would help, but the visual doesn't show up on the podcast. Well, but, that, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting analogy because, you know, and it, so super, in order for Super Mario to throw fireballs, he has to, he has to find the flower. Is yeah. that a, is it a yeah. flower? Yes. So the thing is, is the person that grows the flower is typically that saying, oh, well, this is what we're great. Look at this beautiful flower we're going. And Mario's going, I don't give a shit about Nothing the flower. Get one I'm gonna, shit about I'm gonna, flower. I'm going to crush that thing. And the benefit of that flower is that I can throw fireballs after, which makes me yes. do X, Y, Z. I and, might and jump higher, run yep. faster, or I can fend off the enemy. And and that's my point is so many entrepreneurs, they get so focused on the flower part of it and not really the benefit to the customer. Why is the customer even give a shit about this part of it? And and they they don't spend enough time thinking about that bigger that bigger picture of it. And then the other thing they completely miss is the go-to-market strategy. Say, okay, you built this thing, but what is your go-to-market strategy? How do people know that you exist? How how do you actually sell this? How do you scale it? 
Okay, so let's back up though. So when you're creating a pitch deck, the very first thing, well, first off, your first slide, you need to introduce your company. And I'm going to highly recommend that your second page is a legal disclaimer. Because you're going to say things in there that you can't guarantee are going to happen. So literally, your second page will be a simple legal disclaimer. It's there just because. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, what Matt had just mentioned, okay, you have to start with the problem. What is the problem that you are solving? We'll use Super Mario again. That's a very palatable example. Super Mario's problem is... Prior to finding the flower, the dude can't throw fireballs. That's right. We need to throw fireballs. So in this case, in our pitch deck, we grow flowers that when you find them, will help you throw fireballs. Yes. Okay? That is the solution. Now, with that, it's simple. Problem, solution. And if you've listened to this podcast before, you've heard me talk about people buying benefits. Yes. You've got to stick with the benefits. Now make it simple. There are a couple problems that you solve. What are they? Do not be overly verbose. The point of your pitch deck is to gain the intention of a potential investor, whether they are looking at it without you speaking or looking at it while you're speaking. And it's got to be as so, simple as possible. It does have to be simple. It needs to be straightforward. Problem, solution. Problem is Mario can't throw fireballs. Our solution grows more flowers, better, faster, and cheaper. So Mario can find them easier and faster and get back to throwing fireballs. That's right. This is a per, but, but hey, look, we're laughing because this is a goofy example. That's important. Next. Who is your target market? In this case, we don't have a big target market. (laughs) We've got Mario and maybe Luigi. So, (laughs) hey, this is a perfect example. This This is very palatable. I think everyone gets this. Now, the problem we've got here is we've immediately, we have immediately recognized we do not have a large target market. But that can be a good thing. Can be. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. By the simple definition of your target market, you're not only you're not only showing a potential investor that you understand exactly who you're trying to sell to, but how like who they are, where they are, all that kind of stuff. So in this case, we have a target market of two. <laughs> right? So our plan is to capture a 50% market share. <laughs> By getting either Mario or Luigi to consistently and regularly buy our product. So we can put all our focus on that though. Right. So market size is just what TAM, total addressable market. Yeah. Now, I mentioned having learned some stuff a few years ago. I went into my process and I was like, man, Gigabook could be used by anybody. That was not an advantage. It it seems like an advantage, and I quickly learned it wasn't. Because if you have literally too many people to try to reach, you talk about that go-to-market strategy. Okay, so who are we aiming for? So while you can say, hey, there are myriad uses for what we've built. However, our market size is best. We are best to focus on X, Y, and Z. In our Mario case... We are going to focus on putting these flowers in Super Mario Brothers. That is our distribution channel, and we are aiming towards our two buyers. Well, and as an investor, the last thing, if somebody comes to me and they they say, oh, I've built the perfect thing that every single person wants to buy, and I know exactly how to sell it to all of them, I immediately say, bullshit. Yeah. No way. And, you know, maybe one of my favorite analogies for this now might be somebody who says, I'm going to create the perfect shirt that everybody is going to buy for every scenario. And it's like, no, that doesn't exist. There is no perfect shirt for every scenario. It's like, I can buy, I can make the perfect gym shirt that somebody might wear to the gym, but that same shirt, you're not going to wear to a business meeting, right? Like people have to be very focused on who they're trying to sell to and then knowing how to reach that exact use case. And too often people try to think they're going to sell it to everybody for everything. And that just never works. 
And, you know, in Congress with what you just said, Matt, I mean, the thing that, and I've seen a lot of pitch decks and a lot of, heard of several pitches. And, you know, Matt mentioned that today's episode's uh, sponsored by Fullscale.io, helping you build software teams quickly and affordably. We've invested almost a million dollars over the last year into startups. So with that yeah. process, we've seen people's decks. We've talked to a lot of different people. And you talk about total addressable market size. The thing that annoys me is people are like, well, we've got this market and it's 300 million people. And all we need to do is capture 10% of it. Yeah. And, you know, but you're sitting and, and I think the people that, that are giving, that are delivering the message, they say, oh, well, it only sounds like 10%. Yeah, that's 30 million people. Right. Like, yep. the, and, you know, so some of these things, you know, like I, I want to hear about how you're going to capture a tenth of a percent and do it effectively and in a calculated and scalable way. And then I will believe that you may be able to get 1%, 3%, 5%, or 10%. Well, and if it's a market that big, you, I mean, you're going to, someone's probably already planted their flag there and you're going to get in a fight on the way to capturing that market share. Well, and, and really, I would probably look at it the other way. It's like, no, I want you to capture 10%, but you need to limit the market you're chasing to be much smaller. Like you, yeah, you've that's Id- that whole point. Yeah, yeah. You've you've identified the three thousand perfect people, not the entire human species that could be your customer. You know, well, for example, with Mario, we're we're going to market our services to Super Mario Brothers, but we don't think Sonic Sonic the Hedgehog is a very good fit. Nope, not going to waste our time with his there, ass. There is a much. There's almost no likelihood that he needs that the same way the other market does. So we're going to focus all of our energy, effort, and emotion on gaining that 50% market share of here. Okay. So, you know, the the next part with your pitch deck and your pitch is defining, do you have, or how will you gain traction? Now, if you're early stage and you don't have traction yet, this part is going, you're, you're going to want to punch yourself in the face yep. by the, cause you're going to do it. You've been there. You go yep. through all these, these talks and you're, t- Hey, I got this great. Oh, do you have any traction? Call us back when you do. Cause I'm just going to tell you right now, if you don't have traction, just brace yourself for the fact that you're going to hear that not 99 out of a hundred times, perhaps nobody and wants it's to fr- invest. It's frustrating. Nobody wants to invest in anything these days that doesn't have customers doesn't right. have revenue. A lot of VCs well, and investors won't invest if you don't have at least like $10,000 a month in revenue or something, like some kind of meaningful proven fact that you can sell this thing. Nobody wants to invest. Well, and that's and without that, you're essentially vapor. Yep. And when I say vapor, meaning like you can build software, you can build a lot of stuff, but in the end, the one proof of concept that's the strongest is revenue. I mean, I, I've had people deliver and I've discussed what brilliant ideas that could have been very useful in the world, they weren't monetizable. Or their path to revenue was like, I'm like, great. So in five years, you'll have a dollar. And <clears throat> I mean, that's that's a real thing. So, you know, if you don't have traction, then you need to very clearly and plainly be able to explain what's your path to revenue and you know well, the, the go to market strategy whatever you want to call it how are you going to put a dollar in the bank it's got to or it's got to be something that is clear that there is a market for this even though you don't have <clears> the traction yet it's like we need to raise five million dollars to create this this drug that's going to cure coronavirus like we know there's a market for it we know there's not another solution we've proven that we can solve the problem but those are really difficult things to do. Um, it, it's got to be a very clear market. Like I could see, I've seen that with Uber being like, okay, we're going to build an app that a car comes and picks your ass up. Okay. We all understand that that's a problem that needs to be solved. I'm willing to invest money in it. But there are other things where like, I'm going to rip my couch and maybe somebody will come rip my couch and sleep on it. And people are like, who the hell's going to do this? We want to see proof of this. We want to see traction of this, right? That in, A lot of ideas, you really got to have a lot of traction on, especially if the investor doesn't understand the market. They don't understand the space for sure. Okay. So next piece, who's on your team? In our case, 
it's you and me, Matt and Matt. We've got this, you know, we, we're, we grow magic flowers. I feel like we need to get the hemp people back on. If we're going to talk <laughs> about magic, maybe magic flowers or, but you know, so it, here's the thing is go back in the feed and find all the investment related episodes. Listen to them. You're going to hear a recurring theme. We love people that we invest in the team. Yep. We invest in people. The idea is great, but you have to be ready to sell you. I mean, that's the ma- the key ingredient. And if you've done things that are notable or you have a specific skill or attribute or something or passion, like if the problem that you're solving is, you know, if you've been affected by it, those are all things that investors want to hear. They want to hear about your passion for what you do. They'd love to hear about your success, what skills and attributes. And here's the thing is if you have the ability to put together a solid team and Matt, let's use ourselves as examples. Like you mentioned, you said, I'm a product guy. I'm a programmer. I don't, I, I, that's, I'm a, I have a different set of skills. You know, I'm, I'm the, I'm a front man. I, I, I create hype and marketing and presentation and stuff like that. Now with that, put the people that are best suited to do the things that they're great at highlight that. Yeah. You wouldn't be very, we wouldn't do a very good job in our pitch of talking. Well, and so DeCourcy is going to learn how to be a programmer. No, now. Nah. Nah. Okay. So the next thing, and this is, I think people really, really struggle at doing this sometimes, but who are you competing with? Yeah. And identifying the competition. And how are you going to beat them? I've had people give me pitches and they're like, yeah, we're the only people that do this. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, there's no way. No, There's no way you're the only. And then with five minutes of Googling or less, maybe one, I find a whole list of people that are doing something similar. My favorite, you, <clears throat> my, my favorite are, are the people that are, uh, have, have those sort of ideas. And you're like, Oh, surely somebody else does this. And then on top of it, they also have no idea how they will ever make any money. Yeah. They have well, no idea the how point. they even generate revenue either. And I'm like, yeah. okay, this is a, like a, a huge red flag and another huge red flag. Like this is a stupid idea. Well, but you go back to the team concept and having a well-rounded team. If we were launching a software product, Matt, you and I would be an ideal founder combo because you have the technical background to literally write the code. Yep. And I have skills that are, I have a long track record of, of selling and creating revenue skill? and a, a couple, a couple. They apparently bring in bags of money back to the office from clients is worth it. I mean, Rochambeau champion is not a skill. Ooh, it is. I, what's, I got to take that off my pitch deck, (laughs) but you're right. um, When you, it's really difficult to be a solo entrepreneur and have no other founders. If for no other reason that when times are tough, you have nobody else to help, but also having, you know, other people on the founding team, that can do things that you can't, you know, you, you're really good at a specific skill set. Having those other people is really important. And one of the reasons my last company, Venn Solutions, was so good that we did so well is we had two or three other other partners that were really good at, at sales and other things. And just the right combination, um, that's when like two plus two equals 10 sort of thing. You get the right people on the team that just know how to do things, have the right industry experience. That's another big one that you don't really hear a lot about, like depending on what other in, whatever industry you're going into, having somebody that has that industry experience, either on the founding team or as somebody you hire is super valuable. It's just all about having the right team, even if it's not part of the founders. Well, and, you know, and, and supporting that, Matt, you talk about when you have multiple people that have this pseudo superpower, Mm -hmm. they can focus on just that. Yep. And when you're, when you're the solo, the solopreneur, and I've been in this boat, like you're stuck, you might be the product manager, you might be the general manager, (laughs) you're the sales manager, and you're the janitor. And yeah, I mean, we've even had that a little bit with full scale, right? You're the CEO of full scale, but it's a small company you're wearing a lot of hats. You know, your time would be more valuable doing specific things that you're really, really, really good at. 
and you know it's it's important to try and delegate those other things so you can focus on your superpower right and and that's the the struggle of any small business yeah and that's the you know that's the thing too and I'll tell you firsthand that investors they don't want to hear that they don't want to hear that you're doing eight things that aren't your superpower yeah I mean, I've run into that firsthand yeah. and, you know, I mentioned the gigabook thing. And, uh, so at the time I still owned a ticket brokerage. I still literally owned a company that I was spending the majority of my time focused on mm-hmm. and people, we would talk to investors and they're like, yeah, well, call me back when you're ready to like do this. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, that was, that was the thing. They were not impressed by the fact that we were printing money on the other side of the building and then raising money for something else. And that's, you know, that's part of it. So now the the next part, and we're going to lump the amount that you're trying to raise and financials into one, these should be different slides, but they're very related to each other. So, you know, I, dude, it's unbelievable how many pitch decks I have seen that literally did not tell me, okay, so are you raising like a billion dollars or like 10,000 and what the fuck are you going to do with it? That's the big thing is what are you going to do the money for? And usually if it's an early stage, they're trying to use the money to hopefully get more traction, improve the product, expand the sales team, all that kind of stuff. And depending on the VC and stuff you're pitching to, they're usually kind of focused on companies that have gotten to a certain stage. They're just looking for money to grow sales, gr- grow the go to market side yeah. of it. Yeah. You know, they don't really want to invest in like, well, we think we're going to build a product and maybe we'll be able to sell it after we spend your 3 million. We don't know yet. They're not that, usually that into depend, that. That depends though. So but let's, let's back that up because that's not, that's true, but it can also not be true. So we'll, Matt, we'll use you in as example. You know, you've ex- you've had a huge exit. You've built multiple other companies that are doing well, full scale, Stackify. You've and been able to identify companies that um, that are uh, worth investing in. And it, so, with that, let's just say that you have something new, and it's all you're doing. You could actually go raise a significant amount of money under the premise of saying, hey, look, I have a track record of building profitable and exitable software products or service companies, and this is my next thing. Mm -hmm. And I need $5 million to prove this. Mm -hmm. And there would be people that would write that check to you because you have the track record, you have the street cred. Now, where you're going to struggle with that is if you have absolutely no history. Yeah of that. Now, and this is what's wild. And, you know, some of these pitches that occur out in in Silicon Valley will sometimes be like, Hey, we need $10 million to figure out if our AI solution can even turn into something that generates a client. Like that's the, that's the goal is to see if we can make something that can even generate revenue now in that. And that sounds wild, but that happens all the time. So that the point there though, is the the commercially viable upside of that investment has to be insane. Yeah. It has like, to be like, I mean, we're yeah, going to do nothing. A billion dollar company. Yeah. Or we're going to create Instagram. <clears throat> something. Yeah. Something along those lines. Or, you know, I mean, some of the things that will get stuff like that. These are the, the futuristic, inve- you know, investments. It could be uh, right now it's robotics, AI, machine learning, you know, uh, it, well, now it's kind of tele stuff. Mm-hmm. But, you know, those are the things that will kind of garner those wild investments. Now, look, you got to put, you got to talk about how much you're trying to raise. Mm-hmm. If you're going to get blown out of the water, if you could give the world's greatest presentation up until these slides, and if you do not talk, so how much are you raising? What's the price? What's your use of funds? Yeah. If you fail at these steps, everything that led up to this part of the presentation no one cares. Yep. Nobody cares. No one cares. So, you know, when you talk about financials, I mentioned earlier, you need to have a disclaimer. Okay. Put this in. It's just a simple note. Like if you're talking about your future projections, you need to put a simple disclaimer in there that says these charts are for illustrative purposes. We cannot guarantee this outcome. 
And it, and it feels, it feels like you're at first you put that in and you, it can feel like you're like, well, I'm kind of like negating my own claim. You need to put that in there. Cause if you don't, you could realistically put yourself in a position later where if it fails, your investors could say, yeah, well, they were promising this. So not the funnest part of creating the pitch deck, but that's it. Um, when, you know, the things that you need to have hammered out, how much are you raising? What form of the, like, what's the investment vessel? Are we doing a safe note? Are we doing a convertible note? Is this an equity round? Like any of that and lay it out. Lay it out. And we talk about your use of funds. Okay. So we were raising money for the flower company, right? Yes. So we're going to, we're going to, we need a million dollars. We're going to spend 200,000 of that on pots. Okay. We're going to spend a hundred thousand of it on dirt. We need $200,000 to pay the people to come help grow the flowers. We need $250,000 of cultivation equipment to do all that. And we need another $250,000 of operating capital to make sure that if something goes wrong or in the event that we missed something, and yes, that's valid, that we missed something, that we aren't going to just instantly go broke. These are digital flowers, by the way. I get it. (laughs) I'm just, (laughs) hey, you set the stage. Are you talking about hemp now? (laughs) <laughs> no. Once again, Matt, hemp is not the magic flower. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Don't. I feel like you've probably been at home smoking hemp going, dude, what's the big deal with this? <laughs> the, another problem and solution worth solving there. Yeah. So, you know, here's the thing is like, you know, you have to look at this as the same way as like you went to a store and you wanted to buy something. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the person at the store can do a great job of telling you the features, advantages and benefits of the product. And if they just, uh, okay, if there's no price tag on it, the person doesn't know how much it costs. You don't know how to buy it. You don't know how to finish the transaction. You're going to go, what the fuck are you guys doing here? Well, my, like, my biggest problem with almost every investor deck is their financial forecasts. Like, they're all pretty much universally claim they're going to do a hundred million dollars a year in revenue in like three years. But Hey, look, if that's something that is attainable though, don't be afraid to sell your big dream. Well, that, and that's different. I, I think a lot of investors do want to hear that like this can grow and become something big, right? Which I think is a different thing because most investors are never going to invest in something that's never, that's only can ever do a couple million dollars a year in revenue. Like nobody's going to invest in that. It's not even something you should be raising money for. That's like a lifestyle business or like some little thing. It's not a company that a VC or a big investor wants to invest in, but you, you've got to be able, most, most companies never do more than the, the golden uh, goal is, is I think it was, I don't remember who, who said this, but it was like triple, triple, double, double. Like, when a company is really growing, they will that's triple. Like me when I'm, that's like me when I'm playing basketball, right? They will, yeah. They will triple revenue, then triple revenue, then double revenue, then double revenue. It, it It's not a crazy exponential scale. And like nobody does that except the one in a million unicorn like Instagram did or something like that. Any real company, realistically, you're really going to be doing good if you can grow 40 to 60% year over year. And you're a unicorn if you can like, triple revenue or double revenue for the first three or four years. And then past that, so, you're not going to do that so anymore. A, anyway. a company with $1 million of revenue that triple, triple, double, double, that goes, that goes to three to six to 12. Yeah. You have $24 million of revenue four years later. And you're a unicorn at that standpoint. You're like a one in, you're like the 1%. Right. But most people do financial projections that are probably higher than that. <laughs> Now, look, at the, at the same time, though, you know, I like to, I acknowledge up front. I'm like, hey, look, projections are what they are. When I hear the word projection, I just think wrong. Oh, yeah. Like, they're going to be wrong, but you got to keep them reasonable. Okay, so, and you set, the, you set the stage for me there, Matt, for the very last piece. What's the exit? Yeah. What's How our goal? How do I get here? my money back? Yep. And that's what investors want to hear. Now, you use the term lifestyle business. And for those of you listening, you need, if you're seeking specific types of capital, meaning like a firm or a fund or people like that, they're going to, if you do not, okay, so you don't, you don't know who, when, or where 
or for how much you may get acquired, but you should have some idea or path. Now, a lifestyle business is the is the husband and wife that want to have a dog grooming operation and they've got a great shop and they run it and they're going to own that for 20 years. They're not going to open new locations. It's not going to create products. It's not going to do anything other than that. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with lifestyle businesses, but lifestyle businesses are not typically what investors write large checks for, right? Okay. So investors want to know, like you said, how do I get my money back? And who's who are the potential people that might want to do that? Now, if you have a software or tech company, a lot of the people that acquire other businesses have already acquired other businesses. And it's easy to find some track record. You could say like, hey, look, you know, Accenture uh, bought has over the last five years has made 11 acquisitions of companies that and three of them are similar to us and blah, blah, blah. Um, You know, in the case of Gigabook, there had been a $400 million um, acquisition into it, had purchased a a similar kind of platform, which then kind of sent up that signal flare. Now, with that, if there are big acquisitions in your space ahead of you, you also need to be ready to to talk about how you're going to battle that 800 pound gorilla that is now in the room with you. Well, because if it's if it's a competitor, yeah, if it's a competitor, you have a well armed competitor to deal with now. Well, but so what's interesting is when spaces heat up. So, for example, Stackify. You know, we're in the application performance monitoring space. We don't have a whole lot of competition. You know, it's not like there's hundreds of competitors. Maybe we have 10, 15, 20, right? It, it's a fairly defined number of, of people. Well, eventually you get into a little bit of an arms race and it might be, you know, some company acquired one of our competitors and then somebody else wants to acquire us so they can compete with them, right? You, you get into this space where, you know, trans, uh, products that are, you know, adjacent to us are acquiring us because they want one plus two plus three, you know, they're trying to add these things together and they're trying to acquire things to compete with their competition, uh, which is always interesting. And that, and that's, you get the, um, you know, the, the, those, those product categories start to combine and there are fewer. Well, then uh, also it's better to have more, uh, more bidders at an auction. Mm Mm-hmm. So, and that's the whole point is, you know, like if you can identify, you know, I mean, who, who would po- possibly acquire you? Okay. So we just spent a lot of time talking about the actual pitch deck, which is the actual outline and bones of this pitch that you may give in person. Now, look, you're p- in this day and age pitches. I mean, you're, you should be happy if you actually get to give one. So make your pitch deck reasonable, make it easy to understand, do not make it overly complex. Now, in the event that you get to talk to the people, there are some tips. So first off, this should not be more than 10 minutes long. Should not be more, do not make the people that are listening to you go numb because you won't stop talking, Mm -hmm. right? Yep. Which means the best way to do this you look, you're telling a story. You're telling a story. What's the story? What's your backstory? Who's the villain? What have you overcome? What was your adversity? How did you win? And how, how do you create something? How have you created something that has lasting value, profitability, or an exit? Why are you 10 that's times, why are you 10 times better than the alternative that somebody would Correct. buy? Right. So in order to do that now, look, the first off, if you're going to talk, we've mentioned talking to audiences. Now, if I'm going to speak to an audience, the thing that I'm first thinking about is who am I delivering this message to? Delivering a message to a room full of fourth graders is different than a room full of VCs. Um, These kind of things make a difference. Now, look, if you're talking to investors, I just go with the assumption that they are type A, that they are busy and they want us to get right to the point. Mm Mm-hmm which means be laser focused. Yep. Okay. Like lock in. I try to shorten my statements. Here's the problem we solve. Mm -hmm. Here's the solution. This is why we're better. This is what we do. This is how we do it. 
and, you know, keep it moving. If you find it, you know, the, it's funny. One of the things that it, in this podcast that we, when we would have guests, they'd say, do you have any tips? Sometimes my, you remember when my tip used to be, if you think you're talking too much, you probably are. Like, I mean, that's a, that's a actual tip, you know, cause sometimes, you know, people, they get going, they get going, they get going, they get going, they don't know when to stop and blah, 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 blah. Next thing you know, you have diluted your own point to, you've surrendered to a shitload of words. So, you know, and now, you know, you mentioned earlier, like, dude, have you, I, how about the pitch where you're 10 minutes into it, you can tell they're halfway through it and you're still sitting there going, what the fuck do these people do? Oh yeah. That's the worst. I've actually been in a pitch with you, Matt, where you have, (laughs) um, I'm confused. What exactly do you do? Oh yeah. Now here's the thing is that 10 minute window. If you burn that up, like you look lead with the need. Yep. This is our, this, there is a, okay. So if I had to pitch full scale, there is a huge shortage of software developers everywhere. This is how we solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Right. There you go. You know, and, and by, okay. So we run a tech services company. We help, we make it easy for businesses to quickly and affordably build a team of remote developers. And I'm going to lead with that. You're going to hear that in the first minute. You're going to hear that before you hear about who we are, any of the story or whatever. So you know what it is we sell. Do I have your attention? And then I want to know, why are you different? Why are you better than your competition? Why would people choose you? Why are you unique? And why are you qualified to do this? Yep. So when you get to the part where you talk about your market size and your sales strategy, like how, how are you acquiring customers? Now, you need to know, you need to be precise about this. You know, so, so uh, through spending $10,000 on cost per click advertising on Google, we have learned that it takes 19 clicks to get one paying customer who at the time has a lifetime value of X, Y, Z. We found that we lose these customers one out of five times, so on and so forth. This is like your acquisition strategy, like how you are going to build a pain, like what's your revenue model? And if you can't explain this stuff, I'm don't then just quit. Like to go back to the drawing board and figure it out because mm-hmm. no one's going to give you a million bucks. If you, if you can't very precisely explain how you're going to use the money how you're going to build the revenue and so on and so forth. And the worst thing you can do is go in there and say, well, we're raising a million dollars, but we don't need a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Kiss of death. Yeah. Kiss of death. So, all right. You mentioned earlier that certain public speakers or certain people have an ability to generate excitement, to ha- show passion there can be enthusiasm. Matt, let me tell you exactly why full scale is the best choice, why we do things different, and exactly what we are planning on doing to build a $500 million company. Take my I'd like I'd like to take a minute to tell you that there's a lot of companies that don't have software help. And we um, have used our experience. Okay, that's non-enthusiastic. You have to have some, you have to shock and persuade people's souls to ignite. It, you, and that's, an that's hard to do. The key is yeah. it's an emotional decision by the investor. It's not usually a logical decision. It's more of an emotional decision. So you've got to get them emotionally interested in what you do to make that decision. So, you know, one of the, all right. So after, after talking to investors or different people, like I, you get feedback from people. Like for me, they're always, I love your energy. I love your passion, you know? And, and that's a good thing. Like, that's a really good thing. Cause those are things that are hard to train. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if someone doesn't have passion or energy, oh, I'm just this boring. I sell these flowers and Mario, like he likes them. Like, cause the thing is, is if you're going to build this huge company with huge revenue that has a huge exit value, someone's got to lead the charge. And yeah. if it's not you as that, if, if the company actually manages to grow, and that's a big if, if you don't have some kind of leadership there that's effective, if you don't have it, you are going to have to acquire it. And that is an expensive employee. Yep. Is that fair? Yep. Absolutely. I mean, look, yeah, for me, if I'm talking about full scale, like I can tell you, I can say, look, this is what we've done to sell. This is what we're planning on doing. These are the things we're good at. These are the things we're not good at. You also can't, don't be afraid to say, hey, look, this is, we know, we're aware that we need to approve it this. So, you know, I, I think as we, as we wrap this up is, you know, I, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't consider is like I, practice. We talking about practice? Yep. Wasn't it Alan Iverson who's really famous for that? Well, look, practice is important and, you know, go through the pitch. Refining um, it. Sit, sit your kids down. <laughs> sit your kids down and yeah. have them listen yep. or someone do any of it, roll through it, run a timer. And you look, I'm going to give you a, here's a million dollar practice example. Plan on it, not going word for word. Like you've been there, Matt, we've been sitting there and you can, s- people are giving this pitch and they have it word for word. And then they got knocked off. And you see them, they're frozen. And I know exactly what's going on in their head other than, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, is they are trying to bring themselves back to that word where they can pick it up again. You, you um, never, ever want to rehearse something word for word. You always want to remember just the talking an point. Yeah. It's an outline. Never word yep. for word. So, and that's where the practice part comes in. And just like, you know, that's it. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. And look, if you mess up, okay, look. When bands are playing, when bands are playing in front of an arena full of people, they mess up more than you know. They just keep going. So you know the whole key is is if you mess up, if you're playing the wrong note, you keep playing that. You keep playing wrong notes until you play the right notes again. It happens, but you know the practice part of it. It builds confidence. It will sharpen the message. It'll help you understand how. Like, hey, look, I've written presentations. I'm like, I got 10 minutes and then I, pre- and then I go through them. I'm like, shit, that's like 22 minutes. Okay. Well, based back on the, to the drawing board, based on the questions you get, you know, the next time you pitch the next person, you need to cover this or not cover that. And you keep refining it. Yeah. And I think we end this by talking about some, you know, anticipating questions. Cause you know, you're going to run into a couple questions like Matt, what are a couple, what are you, what do you, what are a couple common questions that you think come up after a pit, an investor pitch is given? Well, like for Stackify, everybody just wants to know, well, how are you different? How do you compare to this competitor? You know, they're the big competitor in the space. How are you different? How do you differentiate yourself? I mean, that's the biggest question we get. How are you planning on scaling this to a much larger audience? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a big one. Um, I, I think that really what you need to be prepared to answer, you know, say, know your numbers, know your business. They're not, you might field a couple questions about the problem and the solution, but I feel that the most, most of the questions that I have after seeing a pitch are related to the sales, the revenue, the growth, like, how are you planning on pulling this off financially? Um, and then sometimes they're related to like, what are you going to, okay, what, what are your contingencies here? You know, like what happens if what you're focused on here isn't everything you dreamt it would be? Are there other applications or anything like that? And then sometimes it's just going to be questions about you. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, like, I mean, simple. I mean, and the thing is, is look, be honest, be open, be transparent because, being full of shit. If you do actually get someone's attention, look, these are are smart people. They figure it out. This is what due diligence is for is backing up that what you say and what you promise and what you're talking about is actually legit. Um, Nothing will, nothing will 
cause an investor to quit paying attention faster than any glimpse of, of trust issues. Like, Absolutely. oh, this person's full of shit. Like, Absolutely. I'm out. I'm out. If I think I can't trust you, like, done. The character so of just, the person's huge. Yeah. Yeah. So just be open, be honest. And like, I'm not afraid to talk about the things that I'm not great at or that the company needs to improve at. It, that's why you're raising capital, right? To fix things, to improve things, to light the fuse on the rocket ship. Oh. You know, anyway, Matt, based on that, I got to go, man. I got a lot of work to do. I got to get my pitch together. You need to get your shit together. That's true. All right, man. I'll see you next time. I'll get right after that, man. See you next time.